and welcome. Gooseberry Fool is a cream dessert dish made from gooseberries. It was a popular dessert in Shakespeare's lifetime, with gooseberries being mentioned by Falstaff in Henry IV Part Two. In today's episode, I'm going to show you how you can make an authentic 16th century recipe for this gooseberry dessert for yourself. I'm Cassidy Cash, and this is DIY History. If you're new here, hello! I'm so glad you're here and that you're joining us to explore the history of William Shakespeare. This is the channel where we explore recipes, games, and crafts from the life of William Shakespeare. That's everything from 1564 to 1616. And sometimes we fudge a little and go this way or that way just a bit to grab really cool things that we just can't leave on the library floor. If you like exploring the life of William Shakespeare, and especially through hands-on activities, then hit that like and subscribe button because we're here every Saturday. As always, let's begin with the history. Gooseberries are mentioned only once in Shakespeare's plays, and that's by Falstaff, when he says all the other gifts a pertinent man, as the malice of this age shapes them, are not worth a gooseberry. It, that comes from Henry IV, Part Two, Act One, Scene Two. As you can imagine, that one reference doesn't tell us much more than the fact that Shakespeare knew what gooseberries were, and apparently Falstaff didn't think they were worth very much. Originally, there were some gooseberries native to England, but the first person to grow them in a private garden kind of on purpose was King Edward I in the 13th century, who purchased a large number of these gooseberries from France. Gradually, the fruit spread widely over the country, but they didn't become very popular because they were small, covered in little bitty hairs, and when you eat them, they're actually quite sour to taste on their own. By the 16th century, naturalists were beginning to list them in their herbals. We find William Turner writing about them in 1551, and then by 1557, Thomas Tusser is writing a poem on husbandry, and that poem mentions gooseberry as an ordinary garden feature. So we can tell that people are starting to grow them a lot more commonly by this time. It wasn't until the 16th century that gooseberry bushes were grown in an increasing number of private gardens. For those of you in the U.S., a private garden is basically your backyard. It's the plants that you like to grow for yourself. And a lot of people in London were starting to do this. Henry VII introduced a green variety of gooseberry to his garden, and he imported his version from France. Around that same time, London chefs discovered that the sour and perky flavor of the gooseberry made it really good to serve with those fatty, rich sort of roasts and meats that you can cook kind of like a marmalade or cranberry sauce here in the U.S. goes with meat pretty often. In France, the gooseberry was popular as a base for a sauce to cover fish, but in England, the gooseberry caught on in popularity for its ability to enhance the flavor specifically of goose, which is where the berry gets its English name, gooseberries. For hundreds of years, various recipes were developed using gooseberries, including the one we're cooking today called the gooseberry fool. The OED indicates that the term fool was first mentioned as a dessert in 1598, made from clouded cream. Why the word fool is used as the name actually gets debated by scholars. Some people suggest it comes from a French word, farle, which means to press, but the OED disagrees, claiming that the definition is inconsistent with the early use of the word. And it does appear that as far as desserts were concerned, the trifle and the fool were interchangeable terms, at least for Shakespeare's lifetime. Now that you know where it comes from, here's what you need to use to make it. You'll need two cups of gooseberries, sugar, egg yolks, rose water. Gooseberry fool can also be made with all kinds of fruit. I have purchased our gooseberries from Amazon. That's right. I couldn't believe it, but we don't have gooseberries located here in the U.S. At least I couldn't find any around where I live. So I ordered them online from Amazon. I'll put the link to that below this episode so you can get gooseberries if you want to, but you can also make this recipe with strawberries, apples, raspberries, or any fruit that you have on hand. For today, we're using gooseberries, but if you find those difficult to find, just pick whatever fruit you have in your kitchen. It'll work just fine. So now that we know what we need, here's the recipe that we're going to use. Now, I found a recipe from 1658 in a book called The Complete Cook. This is a little bit later than Shakespeare's lifetime, but it is actually titled Gooseberry Fool, which I felt like was much more likely to be what Shakespeare would have had in his lifetime. Additionally, my friend Brigida Webster is a culinary historian and on her webpage for the Tudor and 17th century experience, I found some culinary advice specifically about the gooseberry fool. And we're going to follow her advice mixed with this recipe to create this today. Now, 
when you're reading through the recipe, it doesn't say that you need to take the tops and tails off the gooseberry, but these parts don't look like things that you would want to eat. So I started by washing the gooseberries and taking these pieces off. My friend Brigida, again, culinary historian that focuses on the 17th century, lists topping and tailing the gooseberries as the first step in her recipe for gooseberry fool. So I feel like this is an authentic step to take. Next, we want to set it in a skillet of boiling water and when they are coddled enough, strain them. Coddling here is a specific cooking word that meant to cook fruit in water just below the boiling point. This recipe doesn't indicate how long it takes to cook the berries until they're done, but using modernized recipes, I'm concluding that you wanna cook them until they're soft and can easily burst open with the back of a spoon. All the seeds are coming out. Is this coddling? Are we coddling the gooseberries now? Just before boiling, I think we are. 16th century coddling, right there. Once these are hot, it says to get them hot again, but it doesn't explain how to do that. I'm going to assume it means to return them to the pot and get them warm. So basically you cook them up until they burst, drain off the water, and then put the gooseberries back in the pot by themselves. The actual recipe says, then make them hot again. When they are scalding hot, beat them very well with a good piece of fresh butter, rose water, and sugar, and put in the yolk of two or three eggs. You may put rose water into them and so stir it all together and serve it on the table when it's cold. This recipe also, again, doesn't tell you how long to cook the custard here. To make sure we're killing any salmonella, however, I'm using a meat thermometer to measure the temperature. If you cook a custard base until it reaches 160 degrees Fahrenheit, that will kill any salmonella that might be in the eggs. After we got the egg mixture hot enough to be fully cooked, I transfer it to a baking dish and covered it. I placed it in the fridge to cool for a few hours. And then it's done. That's it for this week. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of DIY History. Don't forget that you can grab a printable instruction sheet as well as a nice decorative printable recipe card by being a patron of our DIY History Club on Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash that Shakespeare life. Until next time, I'm Cassidy Cash, and I hope you learn something new about the Bard. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.